I am so glad NXT is back, man. I, I always wait. I always wait in anticipation for NXT to come back when we get done with a takeover. You guys know the process and how it goes. When there's a takeover, the next week, it's really a dead show. They show you nothing but highlights. We'll get a match or two that really don't play into current storylines right now. It's more of a showcase than anything. But I'm really happy NXT is back because last night's show was filled with so much in one hour that I really didn't want it to end. WWE went over and continued the storyline, or should I say, is advancing the storyline with the Aleister Black, who attacked Aleister Black situation. WWE has some ongoing issue now with Ricochet and Pete Dunne. We got Johnny Gargano wanting Tommaso Ciampa. Lars Sullivan is back. Keith Lee fucking decimated some scrub last night in beautiful fashion. You know, we got a lot going on with NXT, and it's it, it's just so great to see it back, man. I, I love it. And it's always a great way to just wash the bad taste that Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live left in your mouth. And NXT last night was the nightcap to what was a very good day. I really enjoyed my second day in Chicago. It's Thursday morning. Tomorrow's the big day. Tomorrow is the big day. StarCast and Podcast Row. It's going to be great. And like I said, man, last night NXT was just a, a great nightcap to a great day. I had... 12 different craft beers. I didn't drink 12 beers. I had a flight of beer tastings mixed with sours, porters, you know, some fruity ales, some barley wines, because I'm a big barley wine guy. And I went to Ballast Point Brewery and I tried a bunch of different things. I had a Bavarian pretzel with some beer cheese. Uh, there was truffle fries, and then I met my good buddy Rusty. If you guys remember Rusty, Rusty is the only one to actually co-host and off the script. He's the only one in 237 episodes, and he co-hosted uh, one day because I had lost my voice. I was battling a flu, and there was no way I was going to get something up, and I wanted to get something up for you guys, so... I gave Rusty the Sunday notes because I remember it was a Sunday episode. He recorded 30, 35 minutes, and you guys loved him. You thought it was a, a very good fill-in replacement for the Sunday that he took over the show. So um, he came down from Milwaukee, and he drove an hour and a half to just have some deep dish pizza with me, man, which was fucking awesome. And, you know, you guys know Rusty. We, uh, we helped him achieve his goal for the Bike MS so he came down and he showed me uh, deep dish pizza for the first time. Giordano's, I believe it was called, or if that's the proper pun, Giordano's, Giordano's, whatever. We went there and I had a Moscow mule, which was way too sweet. And we had spinach and pepperoni deep dish pizza. So it was, uh, it was quite the experience, man. You know, and then I post the picture on Twitter and people are are like, oh, well, it's not traditional deep dish unless it's square. I don't fucking care. Square, round, triangular, it doesn't fucking matter to me. It really doesn't matter to me when I eat pizza. But um, I will say this. Everybody wanted to know, being that I've had New York pizza and now that I've had deep dish pizza in Chicago, which is the best slice of pizza? You want my honest opinion? You can't really compare the two, you know, I said it yesterday, one looks like a fucking meal, and the other one looks like a midday snack, so I guess Chicago goes about their pizza in a way where, you know, one is a legitimate meal, and the other one is just, you know, it is what it is, I, I, I personally prefer the thin crust, I, I really do, I, I like a traditional style pizza, I don't think I can eat that Every day. Normal normal New York pizza to me, normal pizza. This might be normal pizza to you guys. I can eat that uh, two, three times a week because it's just great. And, and, you know, you guys just over abundance of cheese. And I'm a fucking cheese head, but 
You know, I can't I can't be eating deep dish pizza every fucking week, man. That's like a, a delicacy. That's like a, a once a month type of thing, the way you guys make it. You know, but uh, the New York style pizza, man, I'm always going to have, uh, you know, uh, my, my favorite be, be the New York style. But you really can't compare the two. I'm not even going to try and compare the two. So today we're actually going to go to, um, well, what's that place called? Portillo's you guys are talking about? Uh, I got to try a, a Chicago style hot dog. I got to have all this fucking extra garbage on my hot dog. But you guys recommended it to me, so I got to do it. I'm here. I got to do it, you know. So I'll be, uh, I'll be finding one of those places today. And uh, we'll see what's going on, man. I got, a, I got a lot of work to do. We got NXT. I got an all-in preview and predictions video going up. And I got to record off the script for tomorrow because I'm going to be busy as fuck tomorrow. I'm going to be at all-in. I'm going to be at StarCast, Podcast uh, Row, all day. So I'm not going to have any time to record. I, might, I don't know. I might even do a fucking Saturday video there. I have no fucking idea what's going on. But um, let's talk some NXT, man. Let's talk some NXT as... Uh, as the show's on the road here in Chicago. Uh, NXT last night, man, so, so, so good uh, with a fantastic main event of Ricochet and Pete Dunne versus the Undisputed Era. It was advertised as Roderick Strong and Kyle O'Reilly. It ended up being Adam Cole and Roderick Strong, the Undisputed Era, operating under the free bird rule, which should be the case. It's okay for the new day. It's okay for sanity. Why wouldn't it be okay for the Undisputed Era? I, I like that rule. I think it's great. I think it switches things up. And I'm a big fan of the free bird rule, man. The show started off with Johnny Gargano. And he's heading towards the ring on a crutch. Why is he on a crutch? If you guys watched TakeOver in Brooklyn, he tried to knee, or he did successfully knee, Tommaso Ciampa in the face. At uh, fucking Mack truck-like speed down I-95. And he hit Champa with the knee. And then proceeded to launch himself into some, you know, crates and some electrical equipment. And whatever else was there off the stage at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. So he injured himself, quote-unquote. Champa was still on the stage handcuffed, and all he had to do was roll off the stage and land on his feet as the referee made the nine counts, going to ten in the last man standing, and that was the ending of the last man standing match. Tommaso Champa retained the NXT championship. Johnny Wrestling Chance out throughout Full Sail University. I did hear, which I was a little bit concerned of, and it might, it might be insinuated as the weeks go on. But I did read several reports saying that the crowd kind of turned on Johnny and started chanting Johnny Failure at him. Now, the Johnny Failure chants were actually, you know, they were brought on by Velveteen Dream who came out and started them. He called Johnny Johnny Failure. And the Velveteen Dream is probably one of the more over guys on NXT. He may be one of the most over, if not the most over guy in all of NXT, to be honest with you, you know? And when you got a guy like that chanting Johnny Failure and Dream gets reactions when he comes, as soon as that music hits, the Dream is going to get reactions, you know? People chanting his name, people just fucking hang on, on, on every word he says. So when someone like that starts Johnny Failure, which which honestly, I, I'm a big Johnny Gargano mark. It's got a nice ring to it, Johnny Failure. <laughs> you know, I, I use that word a lot. So uh, I'm a little I'm a little pro, you know, failure in this instance. But Johnny comes out. He says right now he doesn't deserve any Johnny wrestling chance. He doesn't deserve any of the fan admiration that's being thrown at him. And he's made a lot of mistakes lately, he says. He said if he won the title in Brooklyn, he would have fixed all the problems that he's currently facing right now, but he didn't. He says he doesn't know where he goes from here and doesn't know how to make things right. He says in Brooklyn, I became Tommaso Ciampa. And this has pretty much been the storyline going forward. Johnny Gargano is becoming the one thing that he hates. And he's letting his emotions get the best of him. Tommaso Ciampa is getting to Johnny Gargano. He is in his head. 
In Brooklyn, I became Tommaso Ciampa. He's in my head. I want him out of my head, he says. William Regal's music hits, and when William Regal is making his way to the ring, you know that shit is about to go down because this is a rare occurrence. Regal's music hits, and he heads to the ring. He ain't taking his gingerly fucking time there. He's making a beeline right to the ring with a microphone in hand. He gets in the ring, and without any questions asked, without any hesitation, no bullshit, he gets in Johnny's face and says, Did you attack Alistair Black. And then Gargano says, look into my eyes. You'll know my answer. He mentioned, you and I have known each other a very long time. And William Regal said, I don't give a shit how long I've known you. Did you attack Alistair Black? And it's right on William Regal to ask Johnny Gargano. Even though I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I don't think it's within Johnny Gargano's character to do that type of thing. He owned up to the mistake. He owned up to the fact that the reason why Aleister Black doesn't have the championship was simply because of him. So why would Johnny go and attack Aleister Black then if he already owned up to the mistake? Doesn't make much sense. Now, Tommaso Ciampa had every right to attack Aleister Black because it was Tommaso Ciampa who fucked up and actually had William Regal make that a triple threat match. So he has more of a, of a reason to attack Aleister Black than Johnny Gargano does. So I know, to this day, after what we've seen last night, it is not Johnny Gargano. So the dream comes out, and his music hits. Crowd's going crazy. And he says, tonight should not be about Johnny. Same old shit, woe is me, Johnny Gargano. He says, the trending topic from Brooklyn was dream. Dream says, tonight, it's not about Johnny failure. I laughed. I had to. It's not about Johnny failure. And then Johnny obviously didn't appreciate uh, the fact that he was called Johnny failure. He kept reiterating, Johnny failure? Really? Johnny failure? Johnny wanted to fight right then and there, but he was on a crutch. So, he said, he's been on a crutch the last couple of weeks to leave the weight off following NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. But he's ready to go now. He throws the crutch at Velveteen Dream. And he wants the match tonight. Regal then gets involved. He separates both of them. And says that they can fight next week. Now, you're looking at this situation. If this was Raw and SmackDown, this would have been the main event of tonight's show. But I love NXT for multitude of reasons. But I love NXT because this was a great segment. Obviously, we all want to see Johnny and Dream fight. And I love NXT because they're holding this match off till next week. They're building... We already got a great main event for this show, but they're building anticipation for the following week. So you already know, man, I got to watch NXT. It's Johnny versus Dream. It's a great selling point right there, man. I love it. It's very old school And I always, always, always appreciate that aspect of NXT, man. They don't rush, and they don't put stuff on the show in a rush manner. They've always got aces in the hole. They got a ricochet. They got Adam Cole. They got everybody, man. The the, the roster for NXT is so good. It is so stacked. And And I'll make mention of that when I talk about the main event. Because the one thing that was going through my head is how much fucking talent NXT has right now, man. And the amount of star power that was in the main event alone on this show is a is really an eye-opener to what NXT is doing right now. But Dream and Johnny Gargano. Velveteen Dream and Johnny Gargano set for next week. Great opening segment. Uh, it really got across, you know, that Johnny is still wanting Champa. He's still apologetic. He's, you know, trying to make good with the fans. I let you down. You know, I want this to be over. Everybody wants it to be over. I want the NXT title. His... Priorities are still there, and he's trying to, you know, make it up to the fans. He's trying to, to say, I'm sorry to the fans. And then you got Dream, who's a great antagonist in his own right, coming out saying, listen, enough of this fucking Johnny Gargano shit. It's my time now. It's not about Johnny failure here. How many more times do you need against Tommaso Ciampa? I love it. I thought it was great. And they're going to go one-on-one next week in what should be a fantastic main event. Dakota Kai versus Aaliyah. 
This was the one women's match on the show. This actually is the first match that opened the show. Uh, Dakota Kai is one of my favorites in NXT, man. Aaliyah, you know, she has the makeup of, of being something really good. And I, I don't want to sit here and say, uh, you know, that she doesn't have a lot of promise, but the thing with Aaliyah is, you know, it, she, she's becoming what I don't like about this this women's look, you know, that, that apparently all, they all feel like they need to have. Uh, Aaliyah is, it's it's like she could fit right next to Carmella and she could fit right next to, you know, all, all those, th- those fucking Barbie dolls on the main roster. You know, she's made up way too much. And, and, I, and I don't know if you guys find that to be an issue. I mean, I mean listen, she's a beautiful woman. I'm not going to sit here and tell you she's not. But I think there's more of an aspect on her looks now than anything. And I, I really, with Aaliyah, I don't think she has, like, a set character. What is her character? What is she about? What is Aaliyah about that's going to distinguish her from a Dakota Kai or, or a Kyrie Sane or a Shayna Baszler or a Candice LeRae or a Bianca Belair or a Nikki Cross or Lacey Evans even? At least Lacey Evans has a, has a fucking character. What is Aaliyah's character? Because right now all I see is a Barbie doll that doesn't have blonde hair. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I think she's smoking hot. But what is there with Aaliyah that makes her stand out? That's the issue here. I don't want... I think she has promise. She's been doing this a little... You know, we've seen her on Breaking Ground. I see, remember Breaking Ground. Aaliyah was on Breaking Ground trying to come up with a gimmick. They, they sat her in, in Regal's office. They went over what type of gimmick she should have. I love that show. I wish it would come back. And, and now, I, I still don't know. Uh, two years after that, I still don't know where Aaliyah stands in NXT. So, that's the issue with me here. And she has a lot of promise. She could be someone that could be very good, but... You know, there, there's a lot more negatives right now than there are positives when it comes to Aaliyah. Dakota Kai wins here. Uh, she got that big Sami Zayn-esque haluva kick in the corner. And then she hits that float over backstabber, which looks beautiful. Dakota Kai hit that. And she beats uh, Aaliyah here on NXT. William Regal is in his office sitting next to, uh, I guess, WWE management or some random management goon. Uh, this guy had a uh, a pen and a notepad, and they were interviewing everybody, or starting at least interviewing everybody that was at the scene of the crime for Aleister Black. So we see Wesley Blake, Steve Cutler, and Gunner, who his name in NXT is Chad Lael. And the Forgotten Sons are finally going to be on television. Next week, they're going to be on television. Another tag team that could be very, very good in NXT. I love NXT's tag team division. And I've been waiting to see the Forgotten Sons act as a unit. They've been on the house show circuit for quite some time. And I'm glad that they finally got their gimmick down. They got to a point with all three of these guys where they're finally going to be able to debut on NXT TV. It's a good, that's a good thing. So they're going to be showed off next week on NXT TV. Cutler says that it's great that William Regal is finally noticing them, but he's noticing them for the wrong reasons. Now, Blake says that they weren't close enough to Aleister Black to take him out and told Regal that the security guys know where they were during the attack. So why don't you ask the security guys? They know where we were during the attack. William Regal seems to accept that they are telling the truth. And notes next week that they will be in a tag team match and we will finally see the Forgotten Sons on NXT TV. That's exciting to me. So we go from interrogating talent about an attack to someone physically and literally being attacked. We go from this to EC3 being attacked in the backstage area of Full Sail University. He was supposed to go one-on-one with Raul Mendoza and Lars Sullivan was seen walking away from the scene of the crime as EC3 was laid to waste by Lars Sullivan, apparently. And he even admitted. (laughs) Lars Sullivan even admitted that, you know, I I attacked EC3. 
So uh, the match didn't take place, but uh, I'll tell you guys in a second what happened with uh, Alistair Black. Oh, not Alistair Black. Lars Sullivan and EC3. Nikki Cross was the next one to be interrogated by William Regal, and she's spinning around in a chair like a little child, and she's laughing. She, she goes on to say that she knows who did the attack. I have the answer that you are seeking, says Nikki Cross. And William Regal wants to know. Nikki Cross thinks the phone rings. When it really didn't ring, she picks up the phone and starts talking to nobody on the other end. She says she has a secret. So William Regal is downright disgusted that he's not getting the answers that he wants when he was blatantly told, listen, I have the answers you need, and she's not giving him the answers that she want, uh, that he wants. Then Bianca Belair comes in, and she says she's been waiting outside all day for this. And you're here messing around with this bitch. So Nikki then starts kind of interrogating and just kind of you know getting at Bianca Belair. She's like, don't touch my hair, Bianca Belair says. Uh, Bianca wants a title shot because uh, obviously she's undefeated. And she beat Deanna Perrazzo just last week on uh, NXT TV. So Nikki Cross says, I want to play. I want to play. And Regal acknowledges Belair's request. So it looks like we're going to get Bianca Belair versus Nikki Cross. And Bianca Belair is going to make uh, another victory here next week, uh, I'm assuming, or in the weeks to come. And that's even going to solidify her further against Kyrie Sane and the NXT Championship, which I do believe is the next feud that WWE is setting up for Kyrie Sane. EC3 versus Raul Mendoza was scheduled to take place, but the match never started as uh, Mendoza was in the ring and is pretty much confronted by uh, Lars Sullivan, who said, listen, uh, you don't need to interrogate me. I'm just going to come out and say it. I attacked EC3. So he left him uh, laid to waste in the back. He tells Mendoza that he's in Lars Sullivan territory, jumps in the ring and completely destroys this guy uh, with a freak accident. And that was pretty much it. Lars Sullivan, people. Lars Sullivan is back. And Lars Sullivan is a pretty damn good promo, man. He's a pretty damn good promo. And he's quite intelligent, I hear. So it's good to see Lars Sullivan back and where he's going to be placed, man. You know, with Lars Sullivan being out, I don't know if he was legitimately hurt or not. I think it was storyline. You know, with the amount of talent that NXT has, Lars Sullivan being out since TakeOver Chicago, you know, that's... He's got a ways a ways away now to get himself back in in pretty much position on NXT because if you're out with the amount of talent that this this roster has, you're going to be bypassed week after week after week after week. And with Lars Sullivan back, I'd love to see Lars Sullivan versus Keith Lee, man. Oh my God, that'd be a uh, a fucking match of two colossal beasts. I I I'd definitely love to see that, man. Speaking speaking of Keith Lee. He was in a match with Luke Menzies. And Keith Lee, man, I'm loving what's going on with Keith Lee. Keith Lee has the chance, uh, you know, bask in his glory. I love it. And I love the fans when they when they chant uh, Keith. They got a great Keith chant going. They got that Keith Lee chant. And he, he, he's doing big things so far, man. This is his second time in a NXT ring in the last couple weeks. And... I can see that this guy's got a very, very, very good future, man. He could be a huge baby face in NXT if positioned the right way. And my God, is this guy fucking freaky. My God, is this guy fucking athletic as fuck, man. Keith Lee, uh, this was pretty easy. You know, Menzies was a, a former rugby player. Said Mauro Ronaldo. He didn't really have much experience. So this was pretty much a squash match. Even though Menzies got some offense in, some rights, some lefts. You know. But Keith Lee here, man. He hit a Horan Karana on Menzies. Which looked fantastic. He did a double knife edge shot. Where he did the big show. He told everybody to shh. And he just lifted both of his hands. And like a fucking gunshot. Slapped the shit out of Menzies chest and he finished Menzies off with a pop-up power bomb that I swear to God, man, I thought he bounced a fucking tennis ball off the off the ground. He popped up. Menzies popped up after being just decimated by this pop-up power bomb. The 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 the, the devastation of this pop-up power bomb was fucking laughable. It was so fucking great, man. Keith Lee drove him into the fucking mat. 
and this guy popped up. So that was it, man. One, two, three. Keith Lee uh, takes care of Luke Menzies quite easily. Oni Lorkin and Danny Burch return in two weeks, man. Another tag team coming back. Look at the tag team division in NXT, man. We haven't even seen the Forgotten Sons yet. Forgotten Sons. Oni Lorkin and Danny Burch. Undisputed Era. We got Street Profits. We got War Raiders. We got TM61. Heavy Machinery. You know? Sabatelli and Moss are on the DL. Look at the tag team division in, in, in NXT, man. I mean, you, you, some great fucking competition there. And this is a one-hour show. Holy shit. Some good, some good things happening in the tag team division. Only looking at Danny Burch. Can't wait to see them back. Main event. Main event we seen here. Ricochet and Pete Dunne versus the Undisputed Era. Supposed to be O'Reilly and Strong. Adam Cole told O'Reilly to sit this one out. He wants Ricochet. Now, the one thing I mentioned earlier, man, with the amount of talent in... NXT. Look, look at the amount of talent that's in this ring alone. Ricochet, Pete Dunne, Adam Cole, Roderick Strong. Look at the amount of championships in this ring. You got Undisputed Era with the Tag Team Championships. Pete Dunne, the UK champion. Ricochet, the North American champion. I'm watching this match, and I'm watching very intently. And the one thing that I see, just from an outsider looking in, is the amount of hunger that is displayed on all four guys. Like, I'm watching Roddy work, and I'm watching Adam Cole work, and I'm watching Pete Dunn work, and then Ricochet, too. The amount of hunger that is just being displayed in their body language, in their movements on all four guys, man. Where NXT is now with, with a roster, it is magnificent. And I use that word, magnificent to see, as far as pro wrestling just, you know, mindset. The amount of talent that's in that ring is going to make everybody in that ring that much better because the amount of talent that is constantly coming into NXT and the, and the amount of talent that's constantly moving up, trying to get better week after week after week, if you slip, if you slip one week, there's going to be someone waiting to take your spot and move on up. You could easily be replaced in NXT because of the amount of talent that's coming in and the amount of talent that's working hard to get a spot on a one-hour show, on a takeover that only has five matches during big WWE pay-per-view weekends. Everybody wants to work to get on a takeover. And the fact that they know that those spots are limited, they're going to show you their absolute best every single time because they want to be on those shows. They want to be featured regularly on NXT TV. And look at these guys. Look at the amount of fucking talent they have just trying to maintain their spot on NXT television. It's a beautiful thing to see. You know, they say competition just is, is great for everybody. It, it breeds uh, a better roster. Competition is the one thing missing right now for WWE when it comes to Raw and SmackDown. This is why I, I want New Japan Ring of Honor to be a legitimate threat because I think the competition that they display by them breaking into the United States, New Japan, is going to make WWE somewhat better. They're going to have to, have to be better. You have to be. And, and, and that's the one thing I got from this main event. It, it's something that's always in the back of my mind. It's something that's always there because the amount of talent on any given takeover show is just unbelievable. But this was different. You had three sets of champions here. You had NXT, Tag Team, UK, and North American Championships all being represented here. And Adam Cole is a future, North, uh, a future NXT champion and a former North American champion in his own right. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So I'm loving the amount of competition right now that's in NXT. I think it's just going to make everybody better, man. This was a fantastic main event for NXT television. This went back and forth, man. Ricochet was on the receiving end of a lot of offense from Undisputed Era. They did their thing. They kept him in hostile territory, did say uh, Moro Ronaldo. I, I really like that, uh, that terminology. You know, Ricochet is in hostile territory. He was grounded in hostile territory because Adam Cole and Roderick Strong just, just made sure Ricochet would not make that tag to Pete Dunne. So uh, Pete Dunne, Actually, did get the hot tag. He comes in. Uh, he nails a big back body drop on Roddy and a step up in Seguri. He takes out Cole. Big roundhouse kick to Roddy. 
nails an X-Plex by sending Cole right on top of Roderick Strong. Pete Dunn then hits a snap German suplex on Strong, which looked absolutely devastating, man. It looked like Roddy's neck just fucking snapped in half on that snap German. Sit-out powerbomb by Pete Dunn for the cover. Cole breaks that up by coming in from the outside. Ricochet then deposits Adam Cole to the outside. Another terminology, uh, another term used by uh, Mora Ronal. I love him, man. I always look for him for, uh, for influence when I do my House of Glory gigs. Cole tries for a super kick. Pete Dunn blocked that attempt by Adam Cole. Ricochet flies and drops on Cole. And then Strong drops Ricochet. Cole and Strong end up on the floor. Pete Dunn hits a moonsault. He does the... Uh, the springboard moonsault off the second rope to the outside. And then Ricochet then wants to fly. He does a suicide dive to the outside. Does not hit any of the Undisputed Era guys, but accidentally takes out Pete Dunne. So the reason why this all fell apart for Ricochet and Pete Dunne was because Ricochet tried to be a little bit too fancy and he ended up hitting his own partner. Ricochet is super kicked by Cole on the outside. Dunn is thrown back in the ring by Kyle O'Reilly, who was not in the match. He just wanted to see his team get the victory. Back in the ring, we get Cole hitting the last shot on Pete Dunn, and that was it. One, two, three. Adam Cole and Roderick Strong win, not by cheating. Undisputed Era just showed you that they are the best tag team in all of WWE right now, and... It was because of Ricochet's untimely error on Pete Dunn accidentally hitting him with that suicide dive. Post-match, Ricochet is brought back into the ring and Undisputed Era absolutely destroy him. Uh, they get a backbreaker and a uh, neckbreaker by Adam Cole. Backbreaker by Strong on Ricochet. Pete Dunn laid to waste in the corner. He was pinned one, two, three. They didn't even bother with him. They just wanted to get some extra shots in on Ricochet being that they feel Ricochet stole something that belongs to them. The War Raiders come out, and they head straight for the ring, and the Undisputed Era fucking runs for the high seas, man. Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, Roderick Strong, they exit quickly as War Raiders come right into the ring. Adam Cole interrogating and just, you know, poking fun at War Raiders because they're a bunch of clowns, and they're going to have their, uh, they're going to have their trouble soon with War Raiders. That's a match I am very much looking forward to, man. War Raiders right now have pretty much run through all competition. We really haven't seen, you know, a great tag team match with War Raiders yet. They beat Heavy Machinery, TM61. They, they beat a bunch of scrub teams. But I honestly think when we get down to it, when it happens, Undisputed Era and War Raiders, man, that is going to be a fucking great match. War Raiders are really going to be tested. Roddy and, uh, uh, Roddy and O'Reilly, man, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a true test. Yeah, we may see more wrestling from War Raiders than we've ever seen so far in NXT if they go two-on-two -two against the Undisputed Era, man. It's going to be a damn good match. And everything that they're doing right now, they're setting up for War Games. War Games, War Raiders, it's going to fit right into their fucking, their, uh, their MO, man. It's going to be great. So they're setting up, they're setting you up for War Games in November, which is going to be fantastic. And I'm still sticking to my guns, man. I think we're going to see Pete Dunne. Tyler Bate and Trent Seven, you know, because those guys, Mustache Mountain ain't done with Undisputed Era. Ricochet and the War Raiders and Undisputed Era. Cole, O'Reilly, and Roderick Strong. That's going to be your main event for NXT TakeOver War Games. That's where they're going. You could see it already. You could see it already. Now, with the interference, or, or the miscue, rather, with Ricochet and Pete Dunne, you know, they're probably going to be uh, going one on one. So that's, again, going to align and set the stars right for War Games. And maybe we get a Ricochet Pete Dunn match out of this thing, man. I think that's exactly what we got. I I I, I read the non-spoiler list for the next couple of weeks, and I do think Ricochet and Pete Dunn do go one on one. And what I'm hearing is one of the best matches of the entire year for WWE. So that should be very interesting in the weeks to come, man. NXT's doing great shit. I have absolutely nothing bad to say about it. Another perfect episode of NXT. And it was uh, quite enjoyable to the uh, end of my Wednesday evening. Thank you guys so very much, man. This is going up, hopefully, with the internet here that it really isn't so good. Uh, it, it's taken me extra long to upload these videos for you guys because I don't have my regular internet and I'm not really set up like I usually am. My laptop sucks. 
But I'm hoping to get this video up to you guys in the early afternoon. I'm going to go uh, be a tourist in Chicago for the afternoon. I'll be back later tonight to record off the script for you guys tomorrow. I got an all-in preview and predictions video going up later. It's going to be good stuff, man. I got a lot of content coming even though I'm here in Chicago. I'm uh, trying to enjoy myself and work at the same time. I got a lot of stuff coming. So NXT review now. All-in preview and predictions video later. Tomorrow off the script. And then tomorrow I'm going to be at StarCast and Podcast Row all day, man. So you guys know where to find me. If you're in Chicago, going to Podcast Row, going to StarCast, I will be there. You guys will see me. I'll have huge off the script banners and table runners hanging up. You'll know where to find me. Thank you guys so very much, man. I'm getting out of here. Hit that thumbs up, and I will see you all later today with another video all in preview and predictions. Until then, take care. Enjoy your Thursdays, and I'll see you guys later and tomorrow at StarCast for Podcast Row. I'll talk to you later.